welcome to the Champions of Active Women podcast. In this podcast, we will interview women who have been successful within athletics and beyond. We hope that the amazing women in these interviews encourage and inspire girls and women to be active for a lifetime, to reach their goals, and to break new barriers in sport and life. This podcast is brought to you by the Active Women's Health Initiative in the Sports Medicine Research Institute at the University of Kentucky. The mission of the Active Women's Health Initiative is to optimize health and promote physical activity and wellness for girls and women across the lifespan. We hope you enjoy our conversations and join us in understanding women's health today to ensure women's health tomorrow. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Dee Dugonski, your host of the Champions of Active Women podcast. Today, I'm pleased to introduce Kathy DeBoer. Kathy is a member of the Active Women's Health Initiative Advisory Board and has been the Executive Director of the American Volleyball Coaches Association since 2006. Before her current position, Kathy spent 23 years in intercollegiate athletics, serving as a coach, administrator, and fundraiser. She was a three-sport collegiate athlete and has a published book on gender and competition. Kathy, welcome. I'm excited about our conversation today. Thanks, Dee. Glad to be here. Great. So could you get us started by telling us about your early life physical activity and sport experiences? Sure. Uh, so I uh, come out of the generation that was where you referred to active girls as tomboys. Uh, and I was that in spades. Um, I was involved in any type of physical activity and any type of competitive event. Um, uh, my my parents accused me of being able to make anything a competitive event, even things like looking up Bible verses or something. It was everything was a competition. Uh, so I just gravitated to to physical activity, and I had male cousins. Uh, my age group all happened to be male cousins, and they were all sports kids mm -hmm. themselves, and so that's who I played with, and so that's how I got started. All right. Can you tell me a little about the sports that you played growing up? Everything. <laughs> everything. So uh, we played basketball. We played uh, tennis. Um, I spent quite a bit of time actually playing tennis. Uh, my parents uh, found a deal where they could trade in s &H green stamps, which most people outside of my age group don't even know about, but you could collect stamps when you uh, went to the grocery store. They would give you stamps, and you put the stamps in a book, and then when you filled your books up, you could go to the store and trade your books for stuff. So my folks were good stamp collectors. They knew a free bit of stuff when they saw it, and so they got me a tennis racket uh, with s &H green stamps. Uh, and then sent me to a local park that was doing a uh, uh, an outreach uh, into the inner city. And I, I say it laughing just a little bit because we weren't really inner city kids, but we lived in an integrated neighborhood. Uh, and so these were the kids from the, in quotes, rich side of town. Uh, and their tennis group was coming in to do a workshop in the inner city, if you will, and it was a dollar for eight weeks of tennis lessons for the summer. So with my s &H green stamp racket and um, the dollar, uh, I went to a local park and got tennis lessons for the whole summer. And it was a great way for my mom, who was a at-home mom, to get me out of the house. Uh, <laughs> it's a win-win for her. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was perfect. Here, go. Okay. here's your tennis racket. Go to the park. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was really, uh, tennis really was my first introduction to physical activity. Okay. But then I also played basketball, and and I, and I was fortunate, D, to, uh, I, I was in a very progressive school system uh, for, I realize now, for the 60s and 70s that offered sports for girls. So I started playing volleyball seventh and eighth grade, basketball, um, had had sports opportunities, softball, uh, young. It, so it sounds like you had a lot of opportunity when you were young. Could you tell how, tell me about how that transitioned um, into your later life sport experiences or physical activity experiences? Well, you get used to being active, uh, I, I guess, is, is the easiest way to put it. And for, for many years, uh, and then I went to college in 1973, and so 
so schools were just adding sports very rapidly for girls, and they were on a body hunt for girls who wanted to play. <laughs> yeah. So you they know, they needed I, you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you didn't have to be you didn't have to be great because nobody was. In fact, there were women that I played with in college um, who had had maybe one year of organized competitive experience in volleyball or basketball. Um, And, uh, you know, there was no NCAA structure at that point. There were no scholarships. Uh, So all the colleges played in one division. Uh, So I was at a small Division III school to start with at Calvin College, and we played against Michigan State and Western Michigan and um, University of Michigan was even very late to the party, even adding women's sports, so they weren't even at the table early on. Um, so, yeah, so so activity was just part of what I did. So the real transition for me, D, was moving from competitive sport into fitness. And I think that can be kind of a hard transition uh, where you're – uh, for a long time, it's like, well, if there isn't a scoreboard, why would you do this? Right. Uh, and and so, yeah, I didn't grow up as a fitness buff. I just grew up as a kid that liked to compete and then transitioned into somebody that's now now kind of addicted to working out. I okay. mean, o- only to the extent that I do it every day. Mm-hmm. But it's kind of part of the morning routine is, you know, stumble out of bed and either go run or you know, ride the bike or whatever. Yeah. Tell me about how that transition went for you. Did it take you a long time to find something that you enjoyed or um, something that you enjoyed that was not competitive? How did, how did it took me a long time? It took me a long time. Uh, absolutely. Um, I would run, uh, simply because I had other people who, uh, you know, my assistant coaches who ran, Mm -hmm. but I hated it. (laughs) Uh, and the rules were if, if we're running to, where we can't talk, then I'm going to quit. Uh, that was the joke. Uh, I didn't. I really wasn't running for fitness, and I ha- road races were the most ridiculous activity I could think of. Part of it because I wasn't a very good runner. Okay. Um, but um, but yeah. So just doing this because it's good for you, uh, and 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 it makes you fit it was a it was a difficult transition and, and took a lot of years the other thing is i was always a team sport athlete i was a better doubles player yeah. tennis than i was a singles player volleyball basketball and so i was very dependent on other people for my activity and and so that was another transition to have to transition into and we have a small workout room in our basement okay. but to doing this by myself um, without somebody that I was accountable to meet on the day that I didn't yeah, want to go. Yeah, it's so different without that social team aspect. Yeah, the accountability of, mm-hmm. I'm, well, I don't really want to run today or my leg hurts or whatever and stuff, but I'm meeting so-and-so, so I'm going to go. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a very different environment. It's something to get used to when you're done, for sure. Um, so could you talk a little bit about, you, you mentioned playing sports in college. Can you talk a little bit about how athletics or being active impacted your education? Yeah. um, You know, it was in the 70s. I was in college from 73 to 78 uh, at um, and finished at Michigan State. And so probably the major impact that it had was I could already see at a small Division three school that there were going to be more opportunities athletically at a bigger school. And so... I would say sports is one of the reasons that I transferred from Calvin College to to Michigan State is um, I saw more opportunities. And again, it wasn't a scholarship right. um, because there wasn't anything like that, but it was that, all right, this was a bigger field, a bigger pond, and there were going to be uh, more opportunities. So the excuse that I gave to my parents uh, for transferring was that I wanted to study music therapy. I was a music major at Calvin, and I wanted to study music therapy, and they didn't have that at Calvin. Okay. I look back on it now, and I think that was really lame uh, because I stayed in music for about a year and a half at Michigan State and realized that music was not nearly as much of my passion as sports. So really okay. the reason I transferred was – sports. Um, but I also didn't, I didn't have no interest in being a physical education teacher or whatever. And that was kind of the only option. 
um, I never even thought about a career in sports. So it was, okay, what are you going to do when you grow up? And I graduated from college with absolutely no idea. I ended up with a degree in humanities. Um, uh, you know, women's studies was part of it, and that was a thing that was emerging as a discipline at that time. And I was a feminist, and I was involved, in, very interested in that. Um, and uh, sociology uh, was part of it, and art history was part of it, right. and I already had all kinds of music credits. <laughs> so I ended, so I, I finished with this degree that prepares you for either everything or nothing. Right. You know, it wasn't specific to anything. It wasn't a career line. It right. was not a career mm -hmm. line degree. Um, but I had a BA. So then I was drafted to play professional basketball um, in a just a very er, long, long ago precursor of the WNBA. Um, something, again, that I look back on now and was just a crazy idea that it could succeed at that point. Um, but there were people who were putting teams together and I got drafted, and so I made enough money to live on, and and that's, you know, again, I think my parents were kind of hoping that I was going to get a real job, but I didn't have any skills for a real job, so it was going to be graduate school at some point. Um, yeah, and so from an educational standpoint, maybe even as I see in athletes today, and I certainly saw this when I coached, is sport is such a defining thing in our lives and and being part of that team and being engaged with it, we don't really spend very much time thinking about what's next. Mm -hmm. And so we get done with college. And I think the higher level that you play at, the, the more this is true. I mean, I think Division I kids, um, you know, aren't really very prepared for what's next. I certainly wasn't. Yeah. I remember even now the last basketball game that I played in, we lost when we weren't supposed to. So we lost earlier in the tournament than we were projected to. And just a profound sense of now what? And this was in college, this the last was in college, college game. Yeah. yeah. It was like, well, now, now what? Mm hmm. So yeah, not so, much for that transition. Right, right. So, and and I, I know sc uh, schools are working very, very hard at this. I actually have former, uh, a former employee who works at Northwestern in a college athlete placement internship post-college preparation program. Right. I mean, they've got a full-time person who works with their athletes on this. And I think, way to go. Right. Well, I, I wonder if it works. Uh, I it hope it does. It would be good if it does. Right? Yeah, it would be great if it does, but I'm a little skeptical because mm -hmm. I think we just don't really spend much time thinking about what do we do when our competitive days are done, when our competitive lives are so much part of our definition of who we are. Right. And you obviously found your way into a career related to sports. Cause, so could you talk a little bit about how you found your way into that career and um, if sports or athletics played a role in that? Well, it found me, <laughs> really. Uh, when I finished, uh, the, I, I stopped playing professional basketball after two seasons. I had had a, kind of a series of nagging injuries that weren't going away. And maybe a, a bigger thing is – uh, the league, from my perspective, was going bankrupt. I mean, we we left at the at the end of the spring with them still owing us about thirty percent of what was in our contracts, and uh, and so the timing was just right for me to go to something else. Again, although I had no idea what the something else was, I thought I wanted to go to law school, uh, but I didn't have any money because professional basketball at that time didn't pay anything. So uh, it was subsistence wages. So, uh, it, it, so all right, I'm going to go to law school, but I've got to take the LSAT and I've got to put some money together. So I need a job. And at the same time, c colleges were again on a hunt for women coaches because they were adding programs very quickly. There weren't any coaches who had experience, particularly not women. They wanted to hire women uh, into their coaching ranks. And so if you had played 
That was good enough. Yeah. So I finished two years of playing professional basketball and get a job at Ferris State University coaching volleyball, which <laughs> I played in college. Right. But I hadn't played for two years. But it's like, but oh, you played in college. OK, good enough. Right. Uh, and, and so here here I am in a in an athletics department in a coaching job at 25. Mm-hmm. Um, I was terrible. I mean, my team <laughs> succeeded in spite of me, not because of me. Um, I, again, was competitive, so I went out and recruited hard, good athletes. Right. Uh, and then they survived my lack of ability to teach them anything uh, for, for quite I'm a while. I'm sure you taught them something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, but, yeah, I mean, so, there, you know, today that would be absurd that you would get a head coaching job – with no more experience than that you'd played right mm-hmm. in at least in women's college volleyball now the interesting thing is i'm seeing it all the time right now in beach volleyball and in men's volleyball which are the two growth areas in our sport right if you've played professional beach volleyball you get a coaching job yeah whether you've coached a day in your life yeah uh, but because we don't have a professional class of coaches mm-hmm because of where the sport is where the itself. sport is mm-hmm. yeah yeah so so really a career in sports found me uh just serendipity right place right time after two years i applied to several law schools and i thought the first year i was going to apply for the top schools and um in keeping with my lsat scores uh, i didn't get in <laughs> And so the next year I was going to apply for the next tier of schools. Well, by that time, I was I loved coaching yeah. and uh, was now going, well, why do I want to go to law school? Right. I think I'll continue coaching. And then I was successful enough at Ferris that I four years into it, I am offered the Kentucky job. I come down here. And so I have a whole career in sports that, uh, that was unplanned, uh, <laughs> but just – came about because there were jobs in sports for the first time. Yeah. And continued, uh, you're probably selling yourself short here, continued because you were successful in those those positions, right? Well, yeah. I mean, I, I always tell people that, you know, I hate the statement that it's not what you know, it's who you know. Um, because I, I, I agree with the part of it that who you know maybe gets you an interview or gets you a chance at a job. But what you know is what either keeps you the job, absolutely, <laughs> uh, you know, and and gets you promoted. That doesn't any have anything to do with who you know, right? And, and so, um, so so yeah. I mean, I was learning on the fly, but I'm a learner, mm-hmm. and I was given opportunities to do different things uh, in administration. Uh, two times. I got an administrative job simply because the athletics director was really, really irritated with the person who was the senior woman administrator who was in the job. And so she, in one case, left, and she, in another case, um, was moved aside by the AD, and the AD said, here, you're going to do this now. And so, yeah, so learning how to get along, uh, learning how to get over some of my instincts to fight all the time to find discrimination Mm -hmm. behind and around every corner and in every situation was a survival skill that that I had to figure out and had to learn. Yeah. So a few minutes ago, you mentioned that you had some nagging injuries uh, while you were playing. Can you talk about that injury experience while you were playing and if it at all affects your physical activity now? Well, I'm 63 now. And so if I move suddenly... I have an injury. <laughs> you know, I mean, this is something that all of you young people out there, this will happen to you. I didn't think it would happen to me, but it does, you know. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, yeah, so if you if you overdo. So so I had I had torn cartilage in my right knee, um, torn meniscus okay. uh, when I was in college and was one of the first um, surgeries at Michigan State where they were using a scope. Now everything's done with a scope, right. but they were just, you know, the scope was new and everything. And they had hey, they had this deal where they weren't going to have to cut cut into you and stuff because they could do this with a scope. So um, uh, so they did. Uh, they went in with the scope 
and the tear was in a little L-shaped piece of cartilage. Well, they had the scope, but they didn't have the tool where you go into with a, with a, a, a tool and cut, so they couldn't get it out. <laughs> So they can see it, the piece that's torn off and needs to come out, but they don't, Couldn't they can't fix it. They can't get it okay. out. And so they did then, you know, have to have to cut my knee open um, and pull it out. Um, it, yeah. And so you have the post-surgery stuff that you have. I mean, uh, in terms of just aching, uh, you know, some, some um you know, when I kept my knee bent and that kind of thing. But I didn't miss. Uh, they did the surgery in September. September? Yeah. And I played basketball that season. Okay. Um, so the rehab was relatively quick. Um, and I broke all the rules on rehab. <laughs> you know, you were supposed to, you know, not do anything until you could bend your knee at 50, you know, at 90 degrees. So I would lean against a wall and push my leg up against it so I could get it to 90 <laughs> degrees. I would run when I wasn't supposed to mm-hmm. because I wanted to play. And I was that invincible 22-year-old, you know. So right. so probably had some achiness. Because of because the rehab of, process. <laughs> because of, of just not following the protocols right. for rehabilitation. Uh, but I've had no problem since with that knee. I mean, okay. that knee is fine. And now I have an aroma in my left foot. But, I mean, you know, so does everybody else. I mean, it, you know, uh, my shoulder. I, I always – people ask me if I still play volleyball. I say I can't lift my right arm above my head. Mm-hmm. And I can, but – Not as well as you could yeah, used yeah, to. Yeah, but if I start swinging – I just took too many swings when I was volleyball coaching and when I was playing. And so there's probably something, but it's not enough to impact my life. I just don't play a lot of sports at this point in time that require fast movement. Sounds good. You've adapted to... I've adapted to my body (laughs) body. at this point. Mm -hmm. Um, So can you think, if you think back over your life and if physical activity and sports were not a part of your life, how would your life have been different? Yeah, that's a really that's a really interesting question, Dee, because it, it's almost impossible for me to envision. Yeah. And so I, I guess some of the things that I would say is one is I would have had to get a real job. And you know, my, my parents who were going through this journey with a young daughter who was a tomboy, and then who was getting opportunities to do some things that they kind of went, what? You're done with college. Can't you just be normal? <laughs> you know, you're like people get a job now or they go to graduate school or whatever. Now you're going to play professional basketball? I was excited. And they were like, oh, no, honey, <laughs> not more. Right. Uh, you know, and, and then, uh, you know, then getting a, a coaching job. And, and I remember them saying to me when they were in their 80s, and and now I was in my 50s, we have come around to the fact that we're now very proud of the things that you've done, which we just never were figuring out how that could actually be a career. Right. And that makes sense for people, (laughs) you know, in their generation. It wasn't a career. It It, wasn't. There was no way. It was Certainly for females. This was something you were going to have to get over. You know, you got over, uh, you got past being a competitive athlete or working in sports, it was like maybe be you know parents today who have children that are musicians or or whatever, and they all they want to do is play the guitar, and it's like that's fine, honey, but you have to do that at night. And yeah, stuff that's because, a hobby. <laughs> yeah, during the day you have to get a job, and it's right. like no, no, I can actually do this for a living, mm-hmm. and so it was that kind of a paradigm shift um, for for all of us uh, that that yes, you could actually have a career working in sports and an administration of sports. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, what? how would it have been different? Well, maybe I would have gone to law school. And, and there's part of – and this is not to throw lawyers under the bus or the legal profession, but I think I would have been a really good lawyer, and I'm not sure that would have been good. <laughs> Because I was so competitive, right? Uh, and I, I have I remember talking to a friend who 
was a, a successful lawyer, and she left it to go work for a nonprofit. And I asked her, well, why did you leave it? And she said, the type of law I was in kills your soul. And I've thought about that since because I think I would have killed my soul. Yeah. <laughs> I would have been in that kind of law, right? you know, or, or, or whatever and stuff. And so, yeah, in a sense, all the things that we talk about sport doing, which takes the energy of kids and the competitiveness of kids and channels it into mm-hmm. appropriate behaviors, right. we hope. Uh, and if it's not appropriate, then we get technicals or then we get tossed out of a game or, um, you know, we get sanctioned if we're coaches, uh, if we go outside of the bounds. I mean, I'm living proof that that works. Uh, you know, channel it into uh, take my aggressiveness and the assertiveness and the um, – what my husband at times calls my feminazi instincts, <laughs> you know, and channel them into something that can be for good. Right. Uh, and That makes a lot of sense. And sport was that for, for me. Mm-hmm. So, um, this, and this is my last question, and I'll give you the opportunity to add anything else you, you have after this, but what would you say to girls and women who are trying to be active over the course of their life or play sports? What would your advice be to them? My major advice, and this may be relative to where I sit now, Dee, as executive director of the American Volleyball Coaches Association, is maintain the joy in it. There's times that I look at what, what's happening with youth, youth sports, and I get really scared. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when I see parents at a, at a volleyball match – with 12 and 13 year olds whose faces are contorted in rage at an at a call by an official or um, at something that the team is doing uh, a misserve or whatever it frightens me Mm -hmm. I, i just go wait a minute this is children at play here right this is not rocket science and yet i understand also the investment of families, how much it costs to have your children involved in youth sports, how much time it takes from you as a family and takes away from other things that you're doing. It's no longer give your kid the SNH Green Stamp tennis racket with a dollar and send them to the park to get them out of your hair. Right. That's not how sport is done today. It is a business and it is expensive. And I, I think... If I would be growing up today, I think two things. One is I think I probably would have blown out my knee uh, because of the numbers that we see in that and uh, among women and girls and the amount of sports specificity and how early it happens. I think I never would have gotten to college without an ACL. Hmm. Um, And and I never would have played multiple sports. Yep. Um, And and so – yeah, so my advice is, you know, have the kids be the ones who are driving this. What do they love? Mm-hmm. And do they love it because they love it? Or do they love it because you love it? Mm-hmm. I mean, I've seen, again, the 15 and 16-year-olds that eh, they're kind of burned out. But, you know, my parents, they just love this weekend thing and they know the other parents and they love the trips and that's their community now and they've invested so much in me and their expectations. I mean, the pressure on kids to meet their parents' expectations for a college scholarship at a certain place. Wow. Um, I, I'm, I'm really glad that I came up when I did now. And I, I wasn't for a long time. I was right. real angry about that. But I, I am now. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, um, you know, fitness is such a – and sport, I'm a, I'm a huge believer that sport is so critical for kids and for healthy adulthood. But it, it needs to be something that's driven by the children and that is – joyful. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean it's not hard. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, Because getting good at anything is hard. So parents need to be there to push their kids through the hard Mm -hmm. by encouraging them, 
by allowing them to fail and and know that you're still loved even though yes you were terrible (laughs) (laughs) it doesn't mean i don't love you it doesn't Mm -hmm. mean you're not going to be better tomorrow let's look at tomorrow right um you know those are such critical lessons that that we need today um but let's not lose sight of joy yeah i think that's such a good message uh is there anything else you'd like to share today no, I appreciate the opportunity to to be part of the the network and and uh, love what you're doing and and Dr. Ireland is doing. I think a a study of where we are with women and and fitness and how our access to it through Title IX has changed us both for the good, but sometimes we have some residual. Uh, health things and injury things um, that are not good. And, you know, I, I happen to be somebody who's still very active after leaving sports mm-hmm. and competition, but I know that's not true for a lot of of um, my compatriots in this. So uh, kudos to you and this network for bringing some of those issues to life. Yeah, well, thank you. I really enjoyed our conversation today. 